Pastor Light, my good friend. Um, I, I really want to touch on three areas um, today. And, and the first area that I want to touch on is to, is to make sure that we, as married people, we do understand that the goal of marriage is not marriage. We sometimes make that mistake of thinking that the goal of marriage is marriage. The goal of marriage is not marriage. And if we can, we can understand that family and understand that properly, uh, some of the pain that we're going through in our marriages would disappear just by that understanding, just by, by receiving those words that actually the goal of marriage has never been marriage, is not marriage, and will not be marriage. The second thing that I want to quickly deal with as we, as we move off that topic is, is, is really, if we understand that the goal of marriage is, is, is not marriage, then Paul in Ephesians 5, it deals with marriage from verses 22 up to about 33. And in that, Paul is trying to shape our marriages um, by infusing two values, the value of love and the value of respect. He, he, he really says, um, he, you want to have a healthy marriage, you want to build a healthy marriage, then love must be something that is there. Understand its context and respect is something that must be there. Also understand the context in which um, respect is uh, used in marriage. And, uh, and the last part, the last part that I really want to deal with um, in, in, in my presentation is, um, is the whole issue of a servant heart in a marriage. Marriage is service. You can't be a pastor if you can't serve in your marriage. What kind of a pastor are you going to be? Because God gives you a marriage so that you can actually um, pastor your small church first. And if you can't small um, pastor your small church, you can't pastor God's big church. You just can't. So we'll go through um, the whole issue of servanthood uh, where we ask God to make uh, me a servant. And pastor Light, as, as I proceed, in each of the three areas, I've decided that after the first area, we will um, have prayers and then move on to the next one, have prayers after that, and move on to the third one and have prayers in each of these areas, because these areas themselves are, are, are prayer items. So I'm not going to leave prayers uh, for the end. And uh, I'm sure I will work around um, the time available in that regard. Perfect, it's all right, sir. Yes. So let me go to 1 Corinthians 9, 24, and I'm reading from the NKJV uh, version. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Paul says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? So if you understand that, run in such a way that you may obtain the one prize that is available run in such a way that you may obtain 
the one price that is available. If you have been married longer than a week or two, by now you know how the hard realities of life in a fallen age can come crashing in. By now you know that. Marriage between sinners does have its messes. It's a mess, a marriage between sinners, it's a mess. It's a mess because of not just troubles outside your marriage to navigate together, but it's a mess created in your marriage by you and your spouse. We believe that God designed marriage, not primarily as an obstacle, but as a trial to be endured, a, a trial to be endured through clenched teeth. But God designed marriage as a pointer and springboard to your greatest joy. Marriage is a point and a springboard to your greatest joy, as long as you understand that on the other side of great pain is great joy. But we have to get to joy. Joy doesn't come to us. We go to joy. We journey towards joy because on the other side of the greatest pain you may be going through in your marriage, walk with hope that you are facing the direction of joy and not just joy, but the greatest joy. God didn't design marriage to be your story and storybook ending, but a fresh beginning to help get you ready for the true happily ever after. When you together will see the great bridegroom face to face. You may have noticed that marriage is a hotly contested topic today. Not only are many forces aggressively trying to redefine its very essence, but the complexities of life in our century add stresses and strains that push countless couples to the breaking point. It may be more important than ever to revisit what God has clearly revealed about marriage. This century pushes many, many couples through its complexities of life, pushes many couples to the breaking point. We, we're dealing with those couples almost every day. They are pushed by complexities of life to the breaking point. How do you, how do you make sure that you don't get to the breaking point um, which the complexities are pushing you? The first thing you need to understand is that God does from time to time choose our marriages as a battlefield with the devil. God sometimes from time to time chooses our marriages as a battleground with the evil one. If you don't understand that you are going to break because that is going to push you to a breaking point. But if you understand that I'm just a battlefield, you will hold on to that, to the one who fights on your behalf. You will stand on the side of God, even in that battlefield. And that's the only way that will lead you not to get to breaking point. And if once again, you don't understand that, you are going to want to quit. Understand you are just a battlefield, nothing more than that. You may be going through so many and so much in your marriage. If your, if your perspective, if your perspective tells you and you believe that, that I am just a battlefield, I'm just a battlefield of God. 
between God and the evil one. If we are to have any strong hope that marriage may actually help our journey through this fallen world, rather than make it all the more deceptive, we desperately need to know what the designer of marriage himself has to say about this unique and this uniquely significant institution. In God's heart, there are two institutions. In God's heart, there are two institutions. One is marriage and the other one is the church. That is why Paul in Ephesians 5, when he really tries to make us understand um, how we need to behave in marriage, he uses the church as an example. It's because in God's heart, there's marriage in the church. And both of these two institutions are in trouble. Both of these institutions are in trouble. Marriage is a special institution in God's kingdom, yet at the same time, a means to the larger end of glorifying our Creator and Savior by putting the beauty of Christ and his church on display before a watching world. Marriage is a special institution in God's kingdom, yet at the same time, it is not just for its sake. It is a means to a larger end, and that larger end is the glorification of our Creator and Savior. By putting the same marriage, our marriages, by putting the beauty of Christ and his church, meaning our marriages on display before a watching world. What is the world watching today? It grieves, it grieves us what we watch in our marriages today. And that leads to divorce run so rampantly even in the church, we talk to people who say to ourselves, we are saved, but we have to beg people who are saved to understand what God means about the whole concept of forgiveness. We have to beg them. Someone who says, I'm saved, does not understand forgiveness in marriage. It makes sense that we tend to overcompensate by emphasizing marriage more than scripture does because divorce runs so rampant in the church and we start to really emphasize marriage more than the scripture does. And we don't realize that by doing so, we may be hurting the very marriages that we're trying to help. Couples, because couples can unconsciously think they are bigger than the intended purpose of marriage, which is to glorify God and bring him to the center of our homes. As David says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless God is at the center of your marriage, you are building in vain. Unless God is the one that you argue with, when you have challenges between the two of you, you are building in vain. The Lord must be at the center, at the center of the building of your house. Couples can all too easily become self-focused if we think that marriage is what it is. Couples can all too easily become self-focused rather than mission-focused. Singles who once radically served Jesus 
may now spend their days merely improving and enjoying their marriage because they have lost perspective. Other couples may quarrel without stop and spend their days in counseling sessions and in despair. Either way, these couples become virtually worthless for kingdom purposes because they have lost perspective. This is why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If we have to run to win the prize, we must have undivided devotion to the Lord. That's the only way we are going to run and secure the only prize that is waiting for us. The goal of marriage is undivided devotion to the Lord. And I want you to meditate on those words. The goal of marriage is not marriage itself, but it is undivided devotion to the Lord. Remember that the Bible is not a book about marriage. It is a book about God and his kingdom. If we, we try to put marriage at the center of the Bible or try and find it, we are going to miss the point. We are going to miss the goal. We must find God and his kingdom in the Bible. Then our marriages would be restored. The best thing we can do with our brief lives on earth is to devote ourselves to him and his mission. And this is the goal. And marriage can actually help us achieve this goal. That's why Paul encourages marriage for those who are tempted sexually. A healthy marriage helps to prevent temptations that would destroy our effectiveness. A healthy marriage helps to prevent temptations that would destroy our effectiveness in the kingdom. We have seen married saints being overcome by lust and temptation. We have seen them behaving as gods to their wives. As a result, they miss the goal. They miss the goal. But remember that whether married or single, the goal is to be completely devoted to God. Marriage can be used as a means of improving our devotion to Jesus. Let's not get it backwards and think of him as the means of improving our marriages. We don't have time to fight, nor to settle down and settle scores. We are in pursuit of a prize. We are trying to make as many disciples as possible at as much depth as possible. What is your marriage communicating to the world? Or are you part of the cohort of fake marriages on Facebook that live for Facebook, but they live a lie? There will be plenty of time to celebrate after we cross the finishing line, after we get to the greatest joy from the other side of the greatest pain. For now, we must just keep running. For now, we must just keep running. Our prayer now, we're all going to pray, and our prayer is to make sure that marriage is a vehicle for revival not revival, a vehicle for healthy marriages. Marriages themselves are a vehicle and must be a vehicle for God's revival. Let us pray.
Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, we give you my glory. Thank you, O God, for marriage. We pray that you make our marriage a vehicle for revival. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. That all doing well in your marriage is because we are a vehicle of revival. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that we the the Thank you. Thank you. Let's proceed. you, Pastor. Hello, Mbulelo, can you unmute yourself, please? My brother Mbulelo, we can't hear you. Can you please unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Amen. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Pastor. Uh, can you yes. hear me, sir? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. We can hear you. But can you please use the Isiseko uh, Institute? That one is clearer. But the, if this, this is, one, the yes. Is, yes, let's proceed then. Okay. Um, now, no husband and wife can be mission focused without their marriage resembling the relationship by Paul as expressed in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, when Paul said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. He sacrifices, she submits. He leads, she follows. He initiates, she, she affirms. He reflects Jesus, she reflects Jesus. That's the life of husband and wife. It's a life of sacrifice and the return is submission of leading and following, of initiation and affirmation and a reflection of Jesus. That's the marriage that Jesus is focusing on. The greatest privilege in marriage is reflecting our savior, Jesus Christ himself. And in God's design, the privilege is equally great, even though Jesus is reflected differently and uniquely by a husband and his wife. 
Seeing Jesus in a husband, he reflects Jesus. Husband, love your wives. To love is to desire, plan, and act for the ultimate good of the beloved. So the husband must know what's best for his wife, and that is God himself. Then he must plan, desire, and act to bring her to a greater knowledge and enjoyment of God. I really want to jump and get to verse 33 in, um, in Ephesians 5. When Paul talks about the mystery in Ephesians 5, there's a second mystery that we, we miss. There's a second mystery that we miss, and that second mystery is in verse 33, where Paul says, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And this is the mystery in verse 33. Paul is not calling us to love when it is nice to love. And is not calling us to respect when it is nice to respect. Because there's no call that should be made. When you feel like loving, you can love. Paul is calling us in verse 33 to love when we feel like not loving. To respect when we feel like not respecting. That call is a call when you don't feel like. And the only way that we can live in love and respect is when we, we think the best of each other, not the worst of each other. If there's an issue, you need to think the best of your wife, not the worst. We are easy, easily pushed to think the worst of each other. That's why our marriages are involved in so much conflict. It's because we think the worst of each other. No relationship can succeed with each partner in that relationship thinking the worst of each other and think that you are going to have a healthy marriage. A healthy marriage can never succeed. The kind of thoughts that we have which are the thoughts from the devil when we think the worst of each other. Let me, let me finish off um, as we are going to quickly pray, finish off with the, with the servanthood. A magnificent marriage begins not with knowing one another. A magnificent marriage begins not with knowing each other as the married couple, but it begins with knowing God. And your marriage is on the journey to a healthy marriage. The minute the two of you know God in your marriage, not church, God, no God, not church. No God, when there is strife in your marriage, you understand that forgiveness is is the oil that actually um, oils a marriage into the future. And that can only be known by people who know God. The essence of Christianity is found in Philippians 2. There Paul urges, urges us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. That's what a servant will do. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of the others. Paul even escalates this teaching by calling us to emulate Christ Jesus, who though he was in very nature God, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. I always say that a Husband in marriage is the chief servant of the house 
And if you are the chief prince, you are occupying a wrong position. You are the chief servant of your home. As head of the family, you are the chief priest. To be a spouse is to be a self voluntary servant. It is not sufficient for us to merely voice our agreement to a few choices we have. We are called to act in such a way that we put others above ourselves. We are expressly forbidden from exalting ourselves for the sole purpose of feathering our own comfort and fame. Otto Piper nails the marriage relationship's potential to create a seven heart in us when he describes marriage as, I quote, the reciprocal willingness of two persons to assume responsibility for each other, a reciprocal willingness of two persons, two people to assume responsibility for each others. Marriage is God's college of servanthood. Unless the students are prepared to go through the lessons in their small church called marriage, they can never be useful tools in the kingdom of God. Marriage creates a situation in which our desire to be served and coddled can be replaced with a more noble desire and that desire is a desire to serve others. Let us pray. Pastor Light, you can take over after the prayer. We still have some time, sir. I will still give you some time. And uh, so I will give you the next 10 minutes. Please, we will we, we still have much to cover if you if you still have any yes. ways. Yes, yes. I can yes. give you up to up to seven o'clock, then I will round up within five minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to love and respect. When we go back to love and respect, as I said, to love is to desire, plan, and act for the ultimate good of the beloved. When you see a husband, I mean, when you see God in your husband, your husband must act accordingly. He must plan, desire, and act to bring yourself as the wife to a greater knowledge and enjoyment of God's word. Husband is called to reflect the sacrificial love of Jesus by dying to himself, his sin, selfishness, and personal interest, and instead enlarging his interest to include his bride's joy in God, not just joy, but joy in God. That means dying to any ambition to be God in your wife's heart. Let God be God in your wife's heart. Don't try and be God. And dying to your preferences when putting hairs above your own. In this sacrificial love, the wife will see a reflection of the Messiah as she looks at her man. And this kind of love breeds the trust that God wants in us. You remember that God has warned us that we must trust no one, including the one who sleeps on your bosom. God is the only one that must be trusted with our lives. Don't trust each other about your lives. They are too huge a responsibility to bestow to each other. Bestow your lives to God and live with each other trustworthy. At the same time, the husband also reflects Jesus by washing his wife with the water of God's word. His goal is her holiness, her obedience to earn satisfaction in her heavenly father. So he speaks God's words to her, reads the Bible with her, and gently disagrees with and graciously, graciously rebukes her when she sins. I still, I still watch pastors closing themselves with God 
in their studies and preparing sermons without preaching that sermon to their wives first. That's the person that God has given you. You need to test your sermon there. So you must read the Bible with her, gently disagrees with and graciously rebukes her when she sins. And the husband also has a responsibility to confess his sin to his wife and repents according to God's word. In his unswerving allegiance to scripture, the husband echoes Jesus' refrain when he met the evil one in the wilderness, when he said it was, it is written. So the husband is really using the written word. She reflects Jesus too. The wife reflects Jesus too. Wives, submit to your own husbands and to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. The wife reflects Jesus too. And she reflects Jesus by submitting to her husband as the head. How does she submit? Paul teaches us that Jesus is under the headship of the Father. Although fully God, Jesus humbled himself by becoming human. When asking his father for the cup, symbolizing his impending death in our place, for the cup to be passed from him, he concluded, yet not according to my will, but according to yours. Jesus is an epitome of submission. The order of submission starts with the husband submitting to God. His wife will see submission from him when he submits to God. And ultimately, Jesus became obedient to the point of death, he submitted to the point of death, even death on a cross. A wife reflects Jesus when she submits to her husband's initiative. This means she will follow her husband's leading even when she prefers or desires another way. God had a reason why he made sure that there's a head of a family. He knew there are times where there will be conflict of views. And he has put the husband as the head to take the decision in the family's interest, not in your interests, in the family's interest. As a godly woman wedded to a man, a wife will submit to his sacrificial initiative and so reflect the glory of Jesus' submission to the Father. The exception is when the husband's will would lead her into sin. The exception is when the husband's will would lead her into sin. Even then, her resistance is a winsome call to repentance motivated by a broken heart because she wants her husband to honor the Lord. And finally, in her humble submission to her husband's leadership, she will be exalted. Paul tells us that based on Christ's submission, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Philippians 2 verse 9. God exalted Jesus because he humbly submitted himself to the Father's headship. God will often exalt the persevering godly wife in this life. And even if not in this life, certainly in the judgment to come, she will receive her reward for her submission. And in the final analysis, glorious exhortation, she will reflect Jesus Christ, who was exalted for his humble submission. The husband reflects Jesus' love as he serves and sacrifices for his wife's good. The wife reflects Jesus loves as she humbly and boldly submits to the leading of her husband, looking forward to the exaltation to come. Marriage is a unique and wonderful stage filled 
with daily opportunities to reflect the glories of our King, Jesus. When we act without love, the wife will react without respect. When the wife acts without respect, the husband will, re will react without love. And there goes the crazy cycle. I do want to say in closing, it is easy to love when there's respect. And it is easy to respect where there is love. Can we pray that God brings love and respect back into our marriages so that our marriages can resemble healthy marriages for global revival? Amen. Amen. Wow. This is this.